What's up, everyone? Welcome to a very special episode of The Horror Show. Today, I get to do something very special to me personally. I actually am about to interview someone that I've been dying to talk to for almost 20 years at this point, ever since I was a 13, 14 year old boy. Now, as most of you know, I'm a big creature movie guy. But what you may not know, if you haven't listened to all of our podcasts or anything like that, is that it all started from the first horror movie I ever saw when I walked into my parents' bedroom one day and they were watching a movie where there was a man in a little dinghy hanging onto a big electrical wire in the middle of the ocean and he's hitting it with an oar. Some of you already know what I'm talking about. And then all of a sudden rising out of the water is this massive great white shark that then chomps on the electrical wire and fries itself and dies and sinks to the bottom of the ocean. This, of course, is the climax for Jaws 2. I didn't know that at the time. I think I wandered into their room at about nine years old when I saw this. But ever since then, I've had a huge fascination with sharks, which obviously when I got old enough, I seeked out all of the Jaws movies and watched those. Um, by old enough, I mean, you know, 11, 12 years old. And so I was always fascinated with sharks, especially great white sharks. Now, fast forward to 1997. And I am just going about my daily life when all of a sudden I see a commercial on TV for a book. I believe it was just the ocean and then you see a little wisp of blood coming down and then it, you know, pulls out and it shows the book, this book, Meg, a novel of deep terror. And I was like, what is that? So I immediately did research and went to the bookstore with my mom at the time and we picked it up, looked at it, and I saw the back, which said two words, Jurassic Shark. Of course, I had to beg my mom to buy the book, and she did, and both she and I have gotten massive enjoyment out of this. What's it about? Well, it's about a prehistoric great white shark, essentially. It's the distant cousin of Carcharodon carcarius, which is the scientific name for the great white shark. Uh, the cousin is Carcharodon megalodon, and it lived way back in the day with the dinosaurs, and it was basically about three times the size of a normal great white, assuming our estimations or our scientists' estimations are correct. And basically, this book is about a scientist named Jonas Taylor. Well, I should say he's a deep-sea submersible pilot, and he has an accident early on in the book where he basically sees something that he doesn't believe can be real. Turns out he thinks he saw a Meg in the deepest parts of the ocean and also turns out he was right. Eventually through the course of the book, a Meg rises to the surface and starts to wreak havoc on all beaches and open ocean. Anything it can get its uh, massive jaws on, it uh, goes for. So if you're any kind of creature movie fan or shark fan, then that is obviously going to appeal to you. Now, over the course of the next, I mean, here we are almost 20 years later, he did Meg. He did the sequel called The Trench. He did the sequel to that called Meg Primal Waters. And then finally, he did the most recent sequel, Meg Hell's Aquarium. And there's actually Meg Night Stalkers, which is going to be coming out, I believe, in the next month or two. Hopefully, if I'm not mistaken. So there will be five books total in this Meg series. And so knowing all that, knowing my love for this series, as well as my love for creature movies and shark movies and giant shark stories, then you guys will understand why I'm super excited about what I'm about to do today. I get to interview the man that created this whole thing. This gentleman right here, Mr. Steve Alton, he is going to be joining me today for an interview. Why? Well, Warner Brothers has officially greenlit Meg, a novel of deep terror, to be made into a big budget blockbuster movie. The book has been bandied about by studios for almost 20 years now, but for whatever reason, it's finally come back home to Warner Brothers and they finally see the value, which I don't understand how they hadn't up until this point. People are going to flock to this film. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and put in a call. We're going to do a Skype interview with Mr. Steve Alton, creator of the Meg series, the Domain Trilogy, Dog Training, the American Male, Shark Man, He's also done the Shell Game. I mean, he's, he's all over the place. He's done tons of books at this point. He's uber talented. So I can't wait for you guys to uh, hear this interview. I can't wait to talk to the guy. So let's get to it. Here we go. 
Okay, everyone, so as I said, I've got my favorite author here, and he has now joined us via Skype. Mr. Steve Alton, thank you very much for joining us today on The Horror Show. My pleasure. Now, of course, I just mentioned to the audience that you um, have had some very awesome news recently with regards to your book, Meg, A Novel of Deep Terror. And I just wanted to know, how does it feel to have it finally be in a place where it's being pushed forward by Warner Brothers? Well, it feels great. I mean, the, the, the group of producers who are doing the movie are, are terrific, first class all the way. The uh, studio is fantastic. Uh, of course, we've been at this altar before a couple times, but uh, never this far along because the movie's been uh, financed and we've got a director attached, we've got a script. Uh, it looks like everything's a go, so knock wood, third time's the charm. So you said that this is the farthest along in the process it's gotten, um, and I've seen news stories talking about you know directors being in talks, namely Eli Roth. I know you might not be able to talk much about that, but you're saying that in the past it hasn't gotten to that stage before? Well, we had a director uh, with New Line Cinema, but we didn't have a good script, and uh, we didn't have the, the, the movie uh, approved for a budget and financed. Uh, this time, uh, the lead producer came in with um, her own financing, uh, privately financed, so we have investors from China and a great group of people, and and it, it makes a difference. And then uh, Warner's involved; they're invested as well. So it's it's a much further loan deal. That's super exciting for a fan like me. I'll tell you that much. As I was telling the audience. I've been following the books ever since the beginning, since the first one came out. I've even got my, uh, my little sticker signed by you and sent out. So I've been following this stuff for a very long time and every time it got stalled out, whether it be because of Mighty Joe Young or Deep Blue Sea, those other creature movies that just didn't perform well, it was really disappointing because I knew the story was so good that people would flock to see it if you know studios would just give it a chance. So. Is it something that you think Jurassic World sort of helped along with its good performance? Jurassic World's performance didn't hurt, but the decision was made long before Jurassic World came out. I think that just made a lot of people who had made the decision a lot more enthusiastic about the decision. Gotcha. And have you been um, involved in, in the scripting a little bit more recently, or is it kind of out of your hands at this point? Uh, I was involved in the, the script that got the financing, so I'm, I'm happy to say that I haven't seen the, the final draft of the script yet. Well, my follow-up to that is this, because you recently just uh, came out with uh, this, which is the anniversary edition of Meg, a novel of deep terror. It's now 20 years later, essentially, and you pretty much completely rewrote it, as well as adding Meg Origins to the beginning of it. Am I correct? Yeah, I wanted to do something special for the Meg heads out there. It, it was 20 years since I wrote the book, and and I had written uh, Meg Origins as an e-book only, and I wanted to give people who, who, who prefer hardbacks uh, and, and uh, hardbound books um, a shot at reading Meg Origins. So what I did was I made Meg Origins the opening of the book, and then when I tried to add the original Meg to it, I realized that the writing didn't match up, that I had written Meg Origins recently, I would written the original Meg 20 years ago, and, and my writing style has improved a lot. and, and uh, and so I essentially rewrote Meg uh, so that it matched Meg Origins, so that it fits seamlessly together. And I added scenes that were in the movie, and I added, I changed some character development, and uh, I, I think it's a much better book. Are there still some anniversary editions left? They can go get them? There are some left. They can go to www.rebelpress.com and order them, or they can order from my site, stevealton.com. They're not sold in stores. There's only 5,000 copies printed in. They're all numbered. Yeah, and it's, it's definitely worth having, you guys, even if you're not a Meghead, because if it's going to tie into the movie, the movie, I can guarantee you, is pretty much going to blow up, and then people are going to be seeking this thing out. So don't miss the boat on it. I know, again, you might not be able to answer this, but is there any tidbit about the movie that you might be able to let us know? I mean, again, it doesn't have to be a huge spoiler or anything, but, uh, but just something. The book takes place uh, after the Megalodon rises from the Mariana Trench. She heads uh, east to California. Uh, in the movie, she heads west, uh, closer to the China mainland. After having done now essentially seven novels, 
dealing with prehistoric sea creatures. Is your interest starting to wane, or how do you keep yourself so into doing that? I, I knew that Meg Night Stalkers was going to be the last for a little while, but your most recent newsletter update, which if you guys don't do it already, go to stevealton.com and sign up for his newsletter. You'll get a little update every month in your email. Now, you said that there might be more Meg coming after Night Stalkers in that. There might be. You know, you, you always leave the window open a crack to get back in, and we'll see how Night Stalkers does. Like I said, there's, there's always a little bit left in the tank. <laughs> Well, moving away from the Meg series and into the other prehistoric sea creature series, your newest book was Vostok, and that came out uh, just a couple of months ago. It was the sequel to the best-selling book, The Lock, which told the story of Scottish scientist Zachary Wallace as he finally figured out the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster in a way that only Steve Alton can do, which is an awesome way, is another way of saying it. Now, in Vostok, you've taken Zachary out of Scotland and put him into one of the most inhospitable places on the planet to investigate some very strange thing, not the least of which is different prehistoric sea creatures. But again, I don't want to get into too much spoiler territory unless you're okay with it, but there's some interesting things that you did in Vostok. Yeah, I don't mind talking about Vostok. There's no NDA about that. Uh, <laughs> the thing with Vostok and, and the difference between Vostok and Alok is, is, is where the, the book takes place, um, although the opening does take place at Loch Ness. You know, I could have gone the standard route of a sequel and put another monster in Loch Ness, but it didn't make any sense. Besides, we have Vostok, which is this incredible subglacial lake in East Antarctica, the coldest, most desolate place on the planet. Two and a half miles beneath the ice is a liquid lake, over 6,000 square miles. It's, it's uh, 1,000 feet deep or more. Uh, it's got hydrothermal vents in it uh, that keeps the water warm. And it's 15 million years old. And, and the most astounding fact, perhaps, above all these things, is that there's some kind of magnetic anomaly down there that's giving off this magnetic impulse, and we don't know what it is. And so all those things are true, so I've taken uh, Zachary and moved him to a different lake to find out what's going on. That's, it's so cool, and, and it always impresses the heck out of me how much research that goes into your books. It's really amazing. It, it, you could almost mistake it for you know, a, a nonfiction narrative, you know, just a, about a dude that, especially in Zachary's case, because those books are written in first person, um, or at least his portions of them. And so it's, it's almost like a travel log. And to know that that stuff is actually real, it blows me away. So kudos to you for all the research you're willing to do, because it's amazing. It makes your product just all that much better. Thank you. It's important to get the details right. For instance, how to get down to a subglacial lake that's two and a half miles beneath the ice. I was fortunate enough to come in contact with Bill Stone with Stone Space Agency. And, and Bill Stone's the group that are putting together the technology to access Europa, which is the frozen oceans of Jupiter's moon. He sort of tutored me on how to get down to Vostok and what it would take and, and uh, made sure the specifications were right on the ship. Beyond that, the magnetic anomaly has an extraterrestrial element to that. And I was in contact with Dr. Stephen M. Greer, who's the foremost authority on extraterrestrial intelligence. And I spent 30 hours interviewing him, and he gave me unbelievable dark secrets of going on with extraterrestrial sightings and UFOs. And, and uh, I just I put it all in the book. That's, it's so awesome, too, because I, I actually, uh, again, you guys, sign on to his newsletter because in one of the newsletters he attached a video where there was a group of people, I can't remember if you were actually there, but there were lights on the horizon. Yeah, uh, Dr. Greer holds these get-togethers called CE5s, which are Close Encounter 5s, which is when a group of people meditate and use remote viewing to actually vector in an extraterrestrial ship to them. And it, it sounds kind of crazy, but uh, extraterrestrial intelligence communicates telepathically, communicates through uh, consciousness. And so if the consciousness is right in the group, they can make an appearance. And I was at a Vero Beach uh, retreat in January of this past year. And on the third night out, uh, we had two lights pop out over the ocean of ships. And uh, we've got all the night vision cameras working and it, pretty amazing stuff. It was interesting seeing that put into the book, and then it ties into time travel as well. Um, so there was a little bit of that aspect in the book, and of which, again, if you're okay with me spoiling a little, a little bit, sure. I was distraught with what you did to David and Mac, and it was like so quick, and I was like, no, what happened? David's, what? 
no, David's got to go get revenge for, for his girl. Like, how's this? And so you took out a couple of characters in the book, but luckily they didn't have to stay that way. I was really hoping. I'm like, oh, please let him do something cool to bring him back because I'm heartbroken right now. So, um, again, kudos to you for the storytelling on that because it was just a page turner trying to make sure that everyone was okay by the end. So do you see more Zachary Wallace coming in the future? Uh, possibly. I don't know. I've, I've got a lot of other books that I want to write too, and we'll see. What you were talking about, though, is is merging the Meg series with the Locke series. Yes. And uh, so Zachary is coming back in Night Stalkers, Meg 5 Night Stalkers, because it's not a foregone conclusion any of those characters survive. Do you feel like you'll be bringing any of those um, alien or time travel aspects into that series as well, or...? No, 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 that'll, that'll stay pure. Zach will briefly reference some of the things that happened in Vostok, but as far as Jonas Taylor knows, it, it, it didn't happen. Gotcha. It was really cool seeing them interact, and you had to take a bit of a time jump, so now we know that they're actually old friends. We didn't necessarily see that relationship develop, but it's cool that they're there now, so I'm, I'm digging that as well. Now, just a quick question to sort of bring it back to horror. The Meg series could be considered action thriller, but some might consider it horror. Would you consider it in the horror genre or more just the action thriller? More of an action thriller. I've never considered it horror. So are you a fan of the horror genre at all? Yeah, I, I enjoy good horror movies. Cool. Is there one or two that pop to mind, just so my audience knows? Uh, well, growing up on the uh, original Frankenstein, I mean, I, I'm not that old, but uh, <laughs> I always thought that the black and white Frankenstein and Bela Lugosi Dracula and, of course, the Boris Kala Frankenstein were classics and King Kong, things like that. I, you know, I was considered that sort of horror genre. The original Bram Stoker's book, Dracula, was fantastic read. Okay, so let's move away from the thriller and the monsters and all that stuff and talk about a couple of your literary divergences, if we can. Sure. Uh, the first of which is sort of in line with Meg, although it's something completely different, and that's called Shark Man. Shark Man is sort of a young adult, adult book. Um, it's uh, about a teenager, Quan Wilson, who's a rising basketball star at his high school. He's driving his his mother one day and he, he's doing things he shouldn't do like texting while he's driving and he gets into a car accident he wakes up in the hospital he's paralyzed from the waist down and his mom is dead and his father is just disgusted by the whole thing and sends him off to uh, live with his uh, maternal grandmother in Florida and uh, so we follow his uh, first days of school at his new school in a, in a wheelchair and he has an opportunity because he's a pretty smart kid to work as an intern at a, a shark stem laboratory in Miami where they're doing experiments on shark stem cells to um, repair spinal cord damages and also cure cancer. And uh, a set of circumstances happened where he has access to these uh, a new prototype for the shark stem cells that he thinks can cure him. And if it doesn't cure him, it'll kill him. And either way, he's better off with the life that he has now. So he's, he's suicidal and it brings him to this choice and he makes the choice and things start happening. <laughs> that's cool. It sounds like Spider-Man, but for sharks, that's, that's, yeah. uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's something that would be up my alley for sure. So I'm going to have to grab that one too. So you said it's for young adults and adults. So that's good. Everyone, people of all ages can appreciate it then. Yes. Awesome. And do you see more Shark Man in the future as well? I, I do. I think that's a series that I want to pursue. Now, let's talk about your other recent divergence, which is really different for you. Now, this one was actually written under a pen name, L.A. Knight. Am I correct? Yes. This one is actually called Dog Training the American Male. <laughs> the book is a comedy, correct? Well, you want to tell everyone what that one's about? Yeah, it, it's based on a script that I wrote years ago. It's about a female talk show host, a radio talk show host, who's a relationship counselor, and none of her relationships ever work. Her ratings are in the toilet. She ends up meeting this wacky guy, Jacob Cope, who's uh, uh, sort of a survivor of Wall Street. He wants to be a ventriloquist. They end up moving in together because their siblings are pushing them to get out from under them. And uh, they begin driving each other crazy. So uh, Nancy's uh, sister tells uh, Jacob, listen, if you want to keep my sister under control, get her a little white foofy dog. And Jacob comes back with a 120-pound German Shepherd from the pound. And... <laughs> And, and Nancy realizes that the training technique she's using on the dog can actually work on Jacob. <laughs> 
That's cool. So is she being pure with her intentions or does she mess with him a little bit too while doing the dog training? She's uh, a typical woman <laughs> looking to take advantage of the situation and, and getting her man up domesticated. And he doesn't know what's going on. How do you come up with an idea like that? I mean, is that just the way you felt like you've been dog trained before or? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think every man wants to be dog trained. Uh, I've been asking my wife to dog train me for years. Um, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure where the idea came up with. I, I do have a German Shepherd, and, and we have a little white foofy dog, too. So, And we've been through the dog training. So a lot of the things that happen in the book happen to us in real life. Now, do you see, um, did you really enjoy the, pro the aspect of, of writing a comedy versus your normal fare? I, I did. Uh, it was a tough time for me. My dad had just passed from cancer. L.A. Knight is short for Lawrence Alton, who was our knight. So wow. it's kind of a tribute to my father. And, wow, that's and, incredible. I needed something light to to take me away from the heaviness. I had just written the Omega Project, and that was pretty dark, and and um, you know it, it sort of rescued my psyche a little bit. I actually really love that that as a pen name. Now I I don't know that most writers put that much thought into their pen names. So that's a great tribute. I'm impressed. Now, do you feel like there's going to be more coming from L.A. Night in the future? I, I do have a few other comedies. So what we're trying to do now is um, we're re-releasing Shark Man. I, I don't think Shark Man was marketed correctly, and I don't think Dog Training was marketed correctly by the publisher. And so um, I'm actually buying back the rights and putting them out as mass market paperbacks with new covers, with new marketing behind it, and uh, see how it does. Awesome. That basically covers my questions for you. I just had a couple of personal notes. I just wanted to say, first off, thank you for everything that you've done, all the work that you've continued to do over the years, because for people like me that, that love your stuff so much, to have a new thing to look forward to, you know, life can get tough, as you know, and there's always that nice shining thing in the future to look forward to. And this year, specifically, 2015 is a banner year for Alton lovers, because we got, you know, we got Vostok, we're getting Meg Five Night Stalkers, and we also got the Meg uh, Anniversary release. So uh, it's really exciting. I wanted to say thank you, and I wanted to tell the audience how awesome Steve is because he's got an email. You can shoot him an email, and I've never seen another writer do this, but he will not only respond to you, and I'm not, I'm not pr over-promising, I hope. No. Uh, he, he'll respond to you. Most times, for me, he's responded within a day. And at the very least, he's going to respond and it, it only increases your appreciation for an author that, that is willing to have that personal touch and just sort of show that he appreciates the people that appreciate him. And the fun thing about it, and this is what I wanted to get to, is if you're young or if you guys have kids that might enjoy this kind of thing, you're going to want to uh, let them have communication. Because I remember I sent him an email once when I was 17 and I said, I believe it was in the trench that a child fell overboard and ended up getting eaten. And I was like, what happened? Why did the, why, what happened with the kid? He, why did you kill the kid? And he said, well... Cecil, sometimes good people get eaten too. <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and that's always stuck with me. I was like, oh, well, there's a life lesson I learned. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to thank you for everything that you've done, Steve. Well, it's actually I who thank you because without you and my other readers, I don't have a career. So you know, I, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Sounds like you got something to get to, so I will let you go. But again, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. And if in the future you happen to have any uh, little Meg movie updates you could drop us, I would love to be the first person to get them out there for you just because I'm going to be watching the news for them anyway. <laughs> Anytime. I'll do what I can. Thank you very much, Steve. And you have yourself a fantastic day and keep up your awesome work, sir. You too. Thank you. So there you go, guys. That was the interview with Steve Alton. It was just exciting to talk to the man. So I hope you guys liked the interview. I'm going to be definitely following up and uh, trying to keep in contact with him as more Meg movie news comes out. Uh, hopefully Eli Roth will get the job. But if not, 
I'll stay on top of who's going to be getting it. It's exciting to know that they have their financing, right? It's not going to be going to California this time. It's going to be going to China, which in today's movie climate, to get those investors, sometimes you do have to sacrifice. Thank you guys for watching the interview. Again, check out his website, stevealton.com. Go and get everything you can from the guy and show him your love because he's awesome. So thanks for watching. And remember, stay scared.